Thirteenth rows. Each word of the Lord's Prayer is a tribute we pay to the perfections of God. We honor His fecundity by the name of Father. Father, Thou who throughout eternity dost beget a Son, who is God like Thee, eternal, consubstantial with Thee, who is of the very same essence as Thee, and is of like power and goodness and wisdom as Thou art, Father and Son, who from Your mutual love produced the Holy Spirit, who is God like unto You, three persons but one God. Our Father. This means that He is the Father of mankind, because He has created us and continues to sustain us, and because He has redeemed us. He is also the merciful Father of sinners, the Father who is the friend of the just, and the glorious Father of the blessed in heaven. When we say "Who art," we honor by these words the infinity and immensity and fullness of God's essence. God is rightly called He who is. That is to say, he exists of necessity, essentially and eternally, because he is the being of beings and the cause of all beings. He possesses within himself, in a supereminent degree, the perfections of all beings, and he is in all of them by his essence, by his presence, and by his power, but without being bounded by their limitations. We honor his sublimity and his glory and his majesty by the words, "Who art in heaven." That is to say, seated as on thy throne, holding sway over all men by thy justice. When we say, "Hallowed be thy name," we worship God's holiness. We make obeisance to His kingship, and bow to the justice of His laws by the words, "Thy kingdom come," praying that men will obey Him on earth as the angels do in heaven. We show our trust in His providence by asking for our daily bread, and we appeal to His mercy when we ask for the forgiveness of our sins. We look to His great power when we beg Him not to lead us into temptation, and we show our faith in His goodness by our hope that He will deliver us from evil. The Son of God has always glorified His Father by His works, and He came into the world to teach men to give glory to Him. He showed men how to praise Him by this prayer, which He taught us with His own lips. It is our duty, therefore, to say it often, with attention, and in the same spirit as He composed it. Fourteenth rows. We make as many acts of the noblest Christian virtues as we pronounce words when we recite this divine prayer attentively. In saying "Our Father who art in heaven," we make acts of faith, adoration, and humility. When we ask that His name be hallowed, we show a burning zeal for His glory. When we ask for the spread of His kingdom, we make an act of hope. By the wish that His will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we show a spirit of perfect obedience. In asking for our daily bread, we practice poverty of spirit and detachment from worldly goods. When we beg Him to forgive us our sins, we make an act of sorrow for them. By forgiving those who have trespassed against us, we give proof of the virtue of mercy in its highest degree. Through asking God's help in all our temptations. We make acts of humility, prudence, and fortitude. As we wait for Him to deliver us from evil, we exercise the virtue of patience. Finally, while asking for all these things, not only for ourselves but also for our neighbor and for all members of the church, we are carrying out our duty as true children of God. We are imitating Him in His love, which embraces all men, and we are keeping the commandment of love of our neighbor. If we mean in our hearts what we say with our lips, and if our intentions are not at variance with those expressed in the Lord's Prayer, then by reciting this prayer we hate all sin and we observe all of God's laws. For whenever we think that God is in heaven, that is to say, infinitely removed from us by the greatness of His Majesty, we place ourselves in His presence, filled with overwhelming reverence. Then the fear of the Lord will chase away all pride. And we will bow down before God in utter nothingness. When we pronounce the name Father and remember that we owe our existence to God by means of our parents, and even the instruction we have received by means of our teachers, who take the place of God and are His living images, we cannot help paying them honor and respect, or to be more exact, to honor God in them. And nothing would be farther from our thoughts than to be disrespectful to them or hurt them. When we pray that God's holy name be glorified, we cannot be farther from profaning it. If we really look upon the kingdom of God as our heritage, 
we cannot possibly be attached to the things of this world. If we sincerely ask God that our neighbor may have the same blessings that we ourselves stand in need of, it goes without saying that we will give up all hatred, quarreling, and jealousy. And if we ask God for our daily bread, we shall learn to hate gluttony and sensual pleasures which thrive in rich surroundings. While sincerely asking God to forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us, we no longer give way to anger and revenge, we return good for evil, and we love our enemies. To ask God to save us from falling into sin when we are tempted is to give proof that we are fighting laziness and that we are genuinely seeking means to root out vicious habits and to work out our salvation. To pray God to deliver us from evil is to fear His justice, and this will give us true happiness for the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It is through the virtue of the fear of God that men avoid sin. Fifteenth Rose The angelic salutation, or Hail Mary, is so heavenly and so beyond us in its depth of meaning that blessed Alain de la Roche held that no mere creature could ever understand it, and that only our Lord Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, can really explain it. Its enormous value is due, first of all, to Our Lady to whom it was addressed, to the purpose of the Incarnation of the Word, for which reason this prayer was brought from heaven, and also to the Archangel Gabriel, who was the first ever to say it. The angelic salutation is a most concise summary of all that Catholic theology teaches about the Blessed Virgin. It is divided into two parts, that of praise and that of petition. The first shows all that goes to make Mary's greatness, and the second all that we need to ask her for, and all that we may expect to receive through her goodness. The Most Blessed Trinity revealed the first part of it to us. St. Elizabeth, inspired by the Holy Spirit, added the second, and the Church gave us the conclusion in the year 430 when she condemned the Nestorian heresy at the Council of Ephesus and defined that the Blessed Virgin is truly the Mother of God. At this time, she ordered us to pray to Our Lady under this glorious title by saying, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. The greatest event in the whole history of the world was the incarnation of the Eternal Word by whom the world was redeemed and peace was restored between God and men. Our Lady was chosen as His instrument for this tremendous event, and it was put into effect when she was greeted with the angelic salutation. The Archangel Gabriel, one of the leading princes of the heavenly court, was chosen as ambassador to bear these glad tidings. In the angelic salutation can be seen the faith and hope of the patriarchs, the prophets, and the apostles. Furthermore, it gives to martyrs their unswerving constancy and strength. It is the wisdom of the doctors of the church, the perseverance of the holy confessors, and the life of all religious, blessed Alan. It is the new hymn of the law of grace, the joy of angels and men, and the hymn which terrifies devils and puts them to shame. By the angelic salutation, God became man, a virgin became the mother of God. The souls of the just were delivered from limbo, the empty thrones in heaven have been filled, sin has been pardoned, grace has been given to us, the sick been made well, the dead brought back to life, exiles brought home, the blessed trinity has been appeased and men obtained eternal life. Finally, the angelic salutation is the rainbow in the sky, a sign of the mercy and grace which God has given to the world. Blessed Alan. Sixteenth Rose Even though there is nothing so great as the majesty of God, and nothing so low as man in so far as he is a sinner, Almighty God does not despise our poor prayers. On the contrary, He is pleased when we sing His praises and the angel's greeting to Our Lady is one of the most beautiful hymns which we could possibly sing to the glory of the Most High. To you will I sing a new song. This new hymn which David foretold would be sung at the coming of the Messiah is none other than the angelic salutation. There is an old hymn and a new hymn. The first is that which the Jews sang out of gratitude to God for creating them and maintaining them in existence, for delivering them from captivity and leading them safely through the Red Sea, for giving them manna to eat and for all his other blessings. The new hymn is that which Christians sing in thanksgiving for the graces of the Incarnation and the Redemption. As these marvels were brought about by the angelic salutation, so also do we repeat the same salutation to thank the Most Blessed Trinity for the immeasurable goodness shown to us. 
We praise God the Father because He so loved the world that He gave us His only Son as our Savior. We bless the Son because He deigned to leave heaven and come down upon earth, because He was made man and redeemed us. We glorify the Holy Spirit because He formed our Lord's pure body in the womb of Our Lady, that body which was the victim for our sins. In this spirit of deep thankfulness should we then always say the Hail Mary, making acts of faith, hope, love, and thanksgiving for the priceless gift of salvation. Although this new hymn is in praise of the Mother of God and is sung directly to her, it is nevertheless most glorious to the Blessed Trinity. For any honor we pay to Our Lady returns inevitably to God, the source of all her perfections and virtues. God the Father is glorified when we honor the most perfect of His creatures. God the Son is glorified when we praise His most pure Mother. The Holy Spirit is glorified when we are lost in admiration at the graces with which He has filled His spouse. When we praise and bless Our Lady by saying the angelic salutation, she always refers these praises to God in the same way as she did when she was praised by Saint Elizabeth. The latter blessed her in her high dignity as Mother of God, and Our Lady immediately returned these praises to God in her beautiful Magnificat. Just as the angelic salutation gave glory to the Blessed Trinity, it is also the very highest praise that we can give to Mary. One day when Saint Mishtilda was praying and was trying to think of some way in which she could express her love of the Blessed Virgin better than before, she fell into ecstasy. Our Lady appeared to her with the angelic salutation written in letters of gold upon her breast, and said to her, My daughter, I want you to know that no one can please me more than by saying the greeting which the most adorable Trinity presented to me, and by which I was raised to the dignity of the Mother of God. By the word Ave, which is the name of Eve, Eva, I learned that God in His infinite power had preserved me from all sin and its attendant misery which the first woman had been subject to. The name Mary, which means Lady of Light, shows that God has filled me with wisdom and light, like a shining star, to light up heaven and earth. The words, full of grace, remind me that the Holy Spirit has showered so many graces upon me that I am able to give these graces in abundance to those who ask for them through my mediation. When people say, The Lord is with thee, they renew the indescribable joy that was mine when the Eternal Word became incarnate in my womb. When you say to me, Blessed art thou among women, I praise the mercy of God, who has raised me to this exalted degree of happiness. And at the words, Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, the whole of heaven rejoices with me to see my Son Jesus adored and glorified for having saved mankind. Seventeenth Rose Blessed Alan de la Roche, who was so deeply devoted to the Blessed Virgin, had many revelations from her, and we know that he confirmed the truth of these revelations by a solemn oath. Three of them stand out with special emphasis. The first, that if people fail to say the Hail Mary, which has saved the world out of carelessness or because they are lukewarm or because they hate it, this is an indication that they will probably be condemned to eternal punishment. The second truth is that those who love this divine salutation bear the very special stamp of predestination. The third is that those to whom God has given this favor of loving Our Lady and of serving her out of love must take very great care to continue to love and serve her until the time when she shall have had them placed in heaven by her Son in the degree of glory which they have earned. Blessed Alan. Heretics, all of whom are children of the devil and who clearly bear the sign of God's reprobation, have a horror of the Hail Mary. They still say the Our Father, but never the Hail Mary. They would rather carry a poisonous snake about them than a rosary. Among Catholics, those who bear the mark of God's reprobation think but little of the rosary. They either neglect to say it, or only say it quickly and in a lukewarm manner. Even if I did not believe what was revealed to Blessed Alain de la Roche, even then my own experience would be enough to convince me of this terrible but consoling truth. I do not know, nor do I see clearly, how it can be that a devotion which seems to be so small can be the infallible sign of eternal salvation and how its absence can be the sign of God's eternal displeasure. Nevertheless, nothing could be more true. In our own day we see that people who hold new doctrines that have been condemned by the Church, with all their would-be piety, ignore the devotion to the Rosary, and often dissuade their acquaintances from saying it with all sorts of fine pretexts. They are very careful not to condemn the Rosary and the Scapular, as the Calvinists do 
but the way they set about attacking them is all the more deadly because it is the more cunning. I shall refer to it again later on. The Hail Mary, the Rosary, is the prayer and the infallible touchstone by which I can tell those who are led by the Spirit of God from those who are deceived by the devil. I have known souls who seemed to soar like eagles to the heights by their sublime contemplation, and yet were pitifully led astray by the devil. I only found out how wrong they were when I learned that they scorned the Hail Mary and the Rosary, which they considered as being far beneath them. The Hail Mary is a blessed dew that falls from heaven upon the souls of the predestinate. It gives them a marvelous spiritual fertility so that they can grow in all virtues. The more the garden of the soul is watered by this prayer, the more enlightened in mind we become, the more zealous in heart, the stronger against all our enemies. The Hail Mary is a sharp and flaming shaft, which, joined to the word of God, gives the preacher the strength to pierce, move, and convert the most hardened hearts, even if he has little or no natural gift for preaching. As I have already said, this was the great secret that Our Lady taught St. Dominic and Blessed Alan for the conversion of heretics and sinners. St. Antonius tells us that that is why many priests acquire the habit of saying a Hail Mary at the beginning of their sermons. Eighteenth Rose This heavenly salutation draws down upon us the blessings of Jesus and Mary in abundance, for it is an infallible truth that Jesus and Mary reward in a marvelous way those who glorify them. I love those who love me. I enrich them and fill their treasures. That is what Jesus and Mary say to us. Those who sow blessings will also reap blessings. Now if we say the Hail Mary properly, is not that a way to love, bless, and glorify Jesus and Mary? In each Hail Mary, we bless both Jesus and Mary. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. By each Hail Mary, we give Our Lady the same honor that God gave her when he sent the Archangel Gabriel to greet her for him. How could anyone possibly think that Jesus and Mary, who often do good to those who curse them, could ever curse those who bless and honor them by the Hail Mary? Both St. Bernard and St. Bonaventure say that the Queen of Heaven is certainly no less grateful and good than gracious and well-mannered people of this world. Just as she excels in all other perfections, she surpasses us in all the virtue of gratitude, so she will never let us honor her with respect without repaying us a hundredfold. St. Bonaventure says that Mary will greet us with grace if we greet her with the Hail Mary. Who could possibly understand the graces and blessings which the greeting and tender regard of the Virgin Mary effect in us? From the very first instant that St. Elizabeth heard the greeting given her by the Mother of God, she was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the child in her womb leapt for joy. If we make ourselves worthy of the greeting and blessing of Our Lady, we shall certainly be filled with graces, and a flood of spiritual consolations will flow into our souls. Nineteenth Rose it is written, Give, and it shall be given to you. To take Blessed Alan's illustration of this, supposing I were to give you a hundred and fifty diamonds every day, even if you were an enemy of mine, would you not forgive me? Would you not treat me as a friend and give me all the graces that you were able to give? If you want to gain the riches of grace and of glory, salute the Blessed Virgin, honor your good mother. He who honors his mother, the Blessed Virgin, is as one who lays up a treasure, Present her every day with at least fifty Hail Marys, for each one is worth fifteen precious stones, which are more pleasing to her than all the riches of this world put together. And you can then expect great things from her generosity. She is our mother and our friend. She is the Empress of the Universe, and loves us more than all the mothers and queens of the world have ever loved any one human being. For as St. Augustine says, the charity of the Blessed Virgin far surpasses the natural love of all mankind and even of all the angels. One day, St. Gertrude had a vision of our Lord counting gold coins. She summoned the courage to ask him what he was doing, and he answered, I am counting the Hail Marys that you have said. This is the money with which you purchase heaven. The holy and learned Jesuit Father Suarez was so deeply aware of the value of the angelic salutation that he said he would gladly give all his learning for the price of one Hail Mary well said. Blessed Alan de la Roche said, Let everyone who loves you, O Most Holy Mary, listen to this and drink it in. Whenever I say, Hail Mary, the court of heaven rejoices, and earth is lost in wonderment. 
I despise the world, and my heart is filled with the love of God when I say, Hail Mary. All my fears wilt and die, and my passions are quelled if I say, Hail Mary. Devotion grows within me, and sorrow for sin awakens when I say, Hail Mary. Hope is made strong in my breast, and the dew of consolation falls on my soul more and more because I say, Hail Mary. And my spirit rejoices, and sorrow fades away when I say, Hail Mary. For the sweetness of this blessed salutation is so great that there are no words to explain it adequately, and even when its wonders have been sung, we still find it so full of mystery and so profound that its depths can never be plumbed. It has but few words, but it is exceeding rich in mystery. It is sweeter than honey and more precious than gold. We should often meditate on it in our hearts and have it ever on our lips so as to say it devoutly again and again. Blessed Allen also relates that a nun who had always had a great devotion to the rosary appeared after her death to one of her sisters in religion and said to her, If I were able to return in my body to have the chance of saying just a single Hail Mary, even without great fervor, I would gladly go through the sufferings that I had during my last illness all over again in order to gain the merit of this prayer. It is to be noted that she had been bedridden and suffered agonizing pains for several years before she died. Michael de Lisle, Bishop of Salubre, who was a disciple and co-worker of Blessed Alan de la Roche in the re-establishment of the Holy Rosary, said that the angelic salutation is the remedy for all ills that we suffer as long as we say it devoutly and in honor of Our Lady. Twentieth Rose Brief Explanation of the Hail Mary Are you in the miserable state of sin? Then call on Mary and say to her, Ave, which means, I greet thee with the most profound respect, thou who art without sin, and she will deliver you from the evil of your sins. Are you groping in the darkness of ignorance and error? Go to Mary and say to her, Hail Mary, which means, Hail, thou who art bathed in the light of the Son of Justice, and she will give you a share in her light. Have you strayed from the path leading to heaven? Then call on Mary, for her name means Star of the Sea, the polar star, which guides the ships of our souls during the voyage of this life, and she will guide you to the harbor of eternal salvation. Are you in sorrow? Turn to Mary, for her name means also Sea of Bitterness, which has been filled with bitterness in this world, but which is now turned into a sea of purest joy in heaven, and she will turn your sorrow into joy and your affliction into consolation. Have you lost the state of grace? Praise and honor the numberless graces with which God has filled the Blessed Virgin, and say to her, Thou art full of grace, and filled with all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and she will give you some of these graces. Are you alone, having lost God's protection? Pray to Mary and say, The Lord is with thee, in a nobler and more intimate way than he is with the saints and the just, because thou art one with him. He is thy son, and his flesh is thy flesh. Thou art united to the Lord because of thy perfect likeness to him, and by your mutual love, for thou art his mother. And then say to her, The three persons of the Godhead are with thee, because thou art the temple of the Blessed Trinity, and she will place you once more under the protection and care of God. Have you become an outcast and been accursed by God? Then say to Our Lady, Blessed art thou above all women, and above all nations, by thy purity and fertility. Thou hast turned God's maledictions into blessings for us. She will bless you. Do you hunger for the bread of grace and the bread of life? Draw near to her who bore the living bread which came down from heaven, and say to her, Blessed be the fruit of thy womb, whom thou hast conceived without the slightest loss to thy virginity, whom thou didst carry without discomfort, and brought forth without pain. Blessed be Jesus, who redeemed our suffering world when we were in the bondage of sin, who has healed the world of its sickness, who has raised the dead to life, brought home the banished, restored sinners to grace, and saved men from damnation. Without doubt, your soul will be filled with the bread of grace in this life and of eternal glory in the next. Amen. Conclude your prayer with the Church and say, Holy Mary, holy because of thy incomparable and eternal devotion to the service of God, holy in thy great rank as Mother of God, who has endowed thee with eminent holiness, in keeping with this great dignity. Mother of God and our Mother, our Advocate and Mediatrix, Treasurer and Dispenser of God's graces, 
obtain for us the prompt forgiveness of our sins, and grant that we may be reconciled with the Divine Majesty. Pray for us sinners, Thou who art always filled with compassion for those in need, who never despise sinners or turn them away, for without them you would never have been Mother of the Redeemer. Pray for us now during this short life, so fraught with sorrow and uncertainty, now because we can be sure of nothing except the present moment, now that we are surrounded and attacked night and day by powerful and ruthless enemies. And at the hour of our death, so terrible and full of danger, when our strength is waning and our spirits are sinking, and our souls and bodies are worn out with fear and pain, at the hour of our death, when the devil is working with might and main to ensnare us and cast us into perdition, at that hour when our lot will be decided forever and ever, heaven or hell. Come to the help of your poor children, gentle mother of pity, advocate and refuge of sinners. At the hour of our death, drive far from us our bitter enemies, the devils, our accusers, whose frightful presence fills us with dread. Light our path through the valley of the shadow of death. Lead us to thy son's judgment seat, and remain at our side. Intercede for us, and ask thy son to pardon us, and receive us into the ranks of thy elect in the realms of everlasting glory. Amen. No one could help admiring the excellence of the rosary, made up as it is of these two divine parts, the Lord's Prayer and the angelic salutation. How could there be any prayers more pleasing to God and to the Blessed Virgin, or any that are easier, more precious, or more helpful than these two prayers? We should always have them in our hearts and on our lips to honor the most blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ our Savior, and His Most Holy Mother. In addition, at the end of each decade, it is good to add the Gloria Patri, that is, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Twenty-third Rose The Rosary is a memorial of the life and death of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the divine spouse of our souls and our very dear friend, wishes us to remember his goodness to us and to prize his gifts above all else. Whenever we meditate devoutly and lovingly upon the sacred mysteries of the rosary, he receives an added joy, as also do Our Lady and all the saints in heaven. His gifts are the most outstanding results of his love for us and the richest presents he could possibly give us, and it is by virtue of such presents that the Blessed Virgin herself and all the saints are glorified in heaven. One day, Blessed Angela of Foligno begged our Lord to let her know by which religious exercise she could honor him best. He appeared to her nailed to his cross and said, My daughter, look at my wounds. She then realized that nothing pleases our dear Lord more than meditating upon his sufferings. Then he showed her the wounds on his head and revealed still other sufferings and said to her, I have suffered all this for your salvation. What can you ever do to return my love for you? The holy sacrifice of the Mass gives infinite honor to the most blessed Trinity because it represents the passion of Jesus Christ and because through the Mass we offer to God the merits of our Lord's obedience, of his sufferings, and of his precious blood. All the heavenly court also receive an added joy from the Mass. Several doctors of the Church, including St. Thomas, tell us that, for the same reason, all the blessed in heaven rejoice in the communion of the faithful because the blessed sacrament is a memorial to the passion and death of Jesus Christ, and that by means of it, men share in its fruits and work out their salvation. Now the Holy Rosary, recited with the meditation on the sacred mysteries, is a sacrifice of praise to God for the great gift of our redemption and a holy reminder of the sufferings, death, and glory of Jesus Christ. It is therefore true that the Rosary gives glory and added joy to our Lord, Our Lady, and all the blessed, because they cannot desire anything greater for the sake of our eternal happiness than to see us engaged in a practice which is so glorious for our Lord and so salutary for ourselves. The Gospel teaches us that a sinner who is converted and who does penance gives joy to all the angels. If the repentance and conversion of one sinner is enough to make the angels rejoice, how great must be the happiness and jubilation of the whole heavenly court, and what glory for our blessed Lord himself to see us here on earth meditating devoutly and lovingly on his humiliations and torments, and on his cruel and shameful death. Is there anything that could touch our hearts more surely and bring us to sincere repentance? 
A Christian who does not meditate on the mysteries of the Rosary is very ungrateful to our Lord and shows how little he cares for all that our divine Saviour has suffered to save the world. This attitude seems to show that he knows little or nothing of the life of Jesus Christ, and that he has never taken the trouble to find out what he has done and what he went through in order to save us. A Christian of that kind ought to fear that, not having known Jesus, or having put him out of his mind, Jesus will reject him on the day of judgment with the reproach, I tell you solemnly, I do not know you. Let us meditate, then, on the life and sufferings of our Savior by means of the Holy Rosary. Let us learn to know him well and to be grateful for all his blessings, so that on the day of judgment he may number us among his children and his friends. Third Decade The Surpassing Merit of the Holy Rosary as a Meditation on the Life and Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ 21st Rose The Fifteen Mysteries of the Rosary a mystery is a sacred thing which is difficult to understand. The works of our Lord Jesus Christ are all sacred and divine because he is God and man at one and the same time. The works of the Blessed Virgin are very holy because she is the most perfect and the most pure of God's creatures. The works of our Lord and of his Blessed Mother can rightly be called mysteries because they are so full of wonders, of all kinds of perfections, and of deep and sublime truths which the Holy Spirit reveals to the humble and simple souls who honor these mysteries. The works of Jesus and Mary can also be called wonderful flowers, but their fragrance and beauty can only be appreciated by those who approach them, who breathe in their fragrance, and who discover their beauty by diligent and serious meditation. St. Dominic divided the lives of Our Lord and Our Lady into fifteen mysteries, which stand for their virtues and their most important actions. These are fifteen pictures whose every detail must rule and inspire our lives. They are fifteen flaming torches to guide our steps throughout this earthly life, fifteen shining mirrors to help us to know Jesus and Mary, to know ourselves, and to light the fire of their love in our hearts. Fifteen fiery furnaces to consume us completely in their heavenly flames. Our Lady taught St. Dominic this excellent method of praying and ordered him to preach it far and wide so as to reawaken the fervor of Christians and to revive in their hearts a love for our blessed Lord. She also taught it to blessed Alan de la Roche and said to him in a vision, When people say 150 Hail Marys, that prayer is very helpful to them and a most pleasing tribute to me but they will do better still, and will please me more, if they say these salutations while meditating on the life, death, and passion of Jesus Christ, for this meditation is the soul of this prayer. For the rosary said without the meditation on the sacred mysteries of our salvation would almost be a body without a soul, excellent matter, but without the form which is the meditation, and which distinguishes it from other devotions. The first part of the Rosary contains five mysteries. The first, the Annunciation of the Archangel Gabriel to Our Lady. The second, the Visitation of Our Lady to Saint Elizabeth. The third, the Nativity of Jesus Christ. The fourth, the Presentation of the Child Jesus in the Temple and the Purification of the Blessed Virgin. The fifth, the Finding of Jesus in the Temple among the Doctors. These are called the Joyful Mysteries because of the joy which they gave to the whole universe. Our Lady and the angels were overwhelmed with joy the moment the Son of God became incarnate. Saint Elizabeth and Saint John the Baptist were filled with joy by the visit of Jesus and Mary. Heaven and earth rejoiced at the birth of the Savior. Holy Simeon felt great consolation and was filled with joy when he took the Holy Child into his arms. The doctors were lost in admiration and wonderment at the replies which Jesus gave. And who could express the joy of Mary and Joseph when they found Jesus after three days' absence? The second part of the Rosary is also composed of five mysteries, which are called the Sorrowful Mysteries, because they show us our Lord weighed down with sadness, covered with wounds, laden with insults, sufferings, and torments. The first of these mysteries is our Lord's prayer and his agony in the Garden of Olives. The second, his scourging. The third, his being crowned with thorns the fourth, his carrying of the cross, the fifth, his crucifixion and death on Calvary. The third part of the rosary contains five more mysteries, which are called the glorious mysteries, 
because when we say them, we meditate on Jesus and Mary in their triumph and glory. The first is the resurrection of Jesus, the second his ascension into heaven, the third the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, the fourth Our Lady's assumption in glory, the fifth her coronation. Such are the fifteen fragrant flowers of the mystical rose tree on which devout souls linger like discerning bees to gather their nectar and make the honey of a solid devotion. Twenty-fourth Rose Meditation on the mysteries of the rosary is a great means of perfection. The saints made our Lord's life the principal object of their study. They meditated on His virtues and His sufferings, and in this way arrived at Christian perfection. St. Bernard began with this meditation, and he always kept it up. At the very beginning of my conversion, he said, I made a bouquet of myrrh fashioned from the sorrows of my Savior. I placed this bouquet upon my heart, thinking of the lashes, the thorns, and the nails of his passion. I applied my whole mind to the meditation on these mysteries every day. This was also the practice of the holy martyrs. We admire how they triumphed over the most cruel sufferings. Where could this admirable constancy of the martyrs come from, says St. Bernard, if not from the wounds of Christ, on which they meditated so frequently? Where was the soul of these generous athletes when their blood gushed forth and their bodies were racked with cruel torments? Their soul was in the wounds of Christ, and those wounds made them invincible. During her whole life, our Savior's Holy Mother was occupied in meditating on the virtues and sufferings of her Son. When she heard the angels sing their hymn of joy at his birth and saw the shepherds adore him in the stable, her heart was filled with wonder, and she meditated on all these marvels. She compared the greatness of the Word incarnate to the way he humbled himself in this lowly fashion, the straw of the crib to his throne in the heart of his father, the might of God to the weakness of a child, his wisdom to his simplicity. Our Lady said to St. Bridget one day, Whenever I used to contemplate the beauty, modesty, and wisdom of my son, my heart was filled with joy. And whenever I considered his hands and feet, which would be pierced with cruel nails, I wept bitterly, and my heart was rent with sorrow and pain. After our Lord's ascension, our Blessed Lady spent the rest of her life visiting the places that had been hallowed by his presence and by his sufferings. There she meditated on his boundless love and on his terrible passion. St. Mary Magdalene continually performed the same religious exercises during the last thirty years of her life when she lived at St. Baume. St. Jerome tells us that this was the devotion of the faithful in the early centuries of the Church. From all the countries of the world they came to the Holy Land to engrave more deeply on their hearts a great love and remembrance of the Savior of mankind by seeing the places and things he had made holy by his birth, his work, his sufferings, and his death. All Christians have but one faith, and adore one and the same God, and hope for the same happiness in heaven. They know only one mediator, who is Jesus Christ. All must imitate their divine model, and in order to do this, they must meditate on the mysteries of his life, of his virtues, and of his glory. It is a great mistake to think that only priests and religious, and those who have withdrawn from the turmoil of the world, are supposed to meditate upon the truths of our faith and the mysteries of the life of Christ. If priests and religious have an obligation to meditate on the great truths of our holy religion in order to live up to their vocation worthily, the same obligation is just as much incumbent on the laity because of the fact that every day they meet with spiritual dangers which might cause them to lose their souls. Therefore, they should arm themselves with the frequent meditation on the life, virtues, and sufferings of our blessed Lord, which are presented to us in the fifteen mysteries of the Holy Rosary. Twenty-fifth Rose The Riches of Holiness Contained in the Prayers and Meditations of the Rosary Never will anyone be able to understand the marvelous riches of sanctification which are contained in the prayers and mysteries of the Holy Rosary. This meditation on the mysteries of the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ is the source of the most wonderful fruits for those who make use of it. Today people want things that strike and move them, that leave deep impressions on the soul. Now has there ever been anything in the history of the world more moving than the wonderful story of the life, 
death and glory of our Savior, which is contained in the Holy Rosary? In the fifteen tableaus, the principal scenes or mysteries of his life unfold before our eyes. How could there be any prayers more wonderful and sublime than the Lord's Prayer and the Ave of the Angel? All our desires and all our needs are found expressed in these two prayers. The meditation on the mysteries and prayers of the Rosary is the easiest of all prayers, because the diversity of the virtues of our Lord and the different situations of His life which we study refresh and fortify our mind in a wonderful way and help us to avoid distractions. For the learned, these mysteries are the source of the most profound doctrine, while simple people find in them a means of instruction well within their reach. We need to learn this easy form of meditation before progressing to the highest state of contemplation. That is the view of St. Thomas Aquinas, and the advice that he gives when he says that, first of all, one must practice on a battlefield, as it were, by acquiring all the virtues of which we have the perfect model in the mysteries of the Rosary. For, as says the learned Cajetan, that is the way we arrive at a really intimate union with God, since without that union, contemplation is nothing but an illusion which can lead souls astray. If only the Illuminists or the Quietists of these days had followed this piece of advice, they would never have fallen so low or caused such scandals among spiritual people. To think that it is possible to say prayers that are finer and more beautiful than the Our Father and the Hail Mary is to fall a prey to a strange illusion of the devil, for these heavenly prayers are the support, the strength, and the safeguard of our souls. I admit it is not always necessary to say them as vocal prayers, and that interior prayer is, in a sense, more perfect than vocal. But believe me, it is really dangerous, not to say fatal, to give up saying the rosary of your own accord under the pretext of seeking a more perfect union with God. Sometimes a soul that is proud in a subtle way, and who may have done everything that he can do interiorly to rise to the sublime heights of contemplation that the saints have reached, may be deluded by the noonday devil into giving up his former devotions which are good enough for ordinary souls. He turns a deaf ear to the prayers and the greeting of an angel, and even to the prayer which God has composed, put into practice, and commanded. Thus shall you pray, Our Father. Having reached this point, such a soul drifts from illusion to illusion, and falls from precipice to precipice. Believe me, dear brother of the Rosary Confraternity, if you genuinely wish to attain a high degree of prayer in all honesty and without falling into the illusions of the devil so common with those who practice mental prayer, say the whole rosary every day, or at least five decades of it. If you have already attained, by the grace of God, a high degree of prayer, keep up the practice of saying the holy rosary if you wish to remain in that state and by it to grow in humility. For never will anyone who says his rosary every day become a formal heretic or be led astray by the devil. This is a statement which I would sign with my blood. On the other hand, if God in his infinite mercy draws you to himself as forcibly as he did some of the saints while saying the rosary, make yourself passive in his hands and let yourself be drawn towards him. Let God work and pray in you and let him say your rosary in his way and that will be sufficient for the day. But if you are still in the state of active contemplation, or the ordinary prayer of quietude, of the presence of God, effective prayer, you have even less reason for giving up the rosary. Far from making you lose ground in mental prayer, or stunting your spiritual growth, it will be a wonderful help to you. You will find it a real Jacob's Ladder, with fifteen rungs by which you will go from virtue to virtue, and from light to light. Thus, without danger of being misled, you will easily arrive at the fullness of the age of Jesus Christ. 26th Rose Whatever you do, do not be like a certain pious but self-willed lady in Rome, so often referred to by speakers on the rosary. She was so devout and fervent that she put to shame by her holy life even the strictest religious in the church. Having decided to ask St. Dominic's advice about her spiritual life, she made her confession to him. For penance, he gave her one rosary to say, and advised her to say it every day. She excused herself, saying that she had her regular exercises, that she made the stations of Rome every day, 
that she wore sackcloth as well as a hair shirt, that she gave herself the discipline several times a week, that she often fasted and did other penances. St. Dominic urged her over and over again to take his advice and say the rosary, but she would not hear of it. She left the confessional horrified at the methods of this new spiritual director who had tried so hard to persuade her to take up a devotion for which she had no taste. Later on, when she was at prayer, she fell into ecstasy and had a vision of her soul appearing before the Supreme Judge. St. Michael put all her penances and other prayers on one side of the scales and all her sins and imperfections on the other. The tray of her good works were greatly outweighed by that of her sins and imperfections. Filled with alarm, she cried for mercy, imploring the help of the Blessed Virgin, her gracious advocate, who took the one and only rosary she had said for her penance and dropped it on the tray of her good works. This one rosary was so heavy that it weighed more than all her sins as well as all her good works. Our Lady then reproved her for having refused to follow the counsel of her servant Dominic and for not saying the rosary every day. As soon as she came to herself, she rushed and threw herself at the feet of St. Dominic and told him all that had happened, begged his forgiveness for her unbelief, and promised to say the rosary faithfully every day. By this means, she rose to Christian perfection and finally to the glory of everlasting life. You who are people of prayer, learn from this the power, the value, and the importance of this devotion of the Holy Rosary when it is said with meditation on the mysteries. Few saints have reached the same heights of prayer as St. Mary Magdalene, who was lifted up to heaven by angels each day, and who had the privilege of learning at the feet of Jesus and his Holy Mother. Yet one day, when she asked God to show her a sure way of advancing in his love and arriving at the heights of perfection, he sent the archangel St. Michael to tell her, on his behalf, that there was no other way for her to reach perfection than to meditate on our Lord's Passion. So he placed a cross in the front of her cave and told her to pray before it, contemplating the sorrowful mysteries which she had seen take place with her own eyes. The example of St. Francis de Sales, the great spiritual director of his time, should spur you on to join the holy confraternity of the Rosary, since, great saint though he was, he bound himself by vow to say the whole Rosary every day for as long as he lived. St. Charles Borromeo also said it every day, and strongly recommended this devotion to his priests and clerics and seminaries and to all his people. Blessed Pius V, one of the greatest popes who have ever ruled the Church, used to say the Rosary every day. St. Thomas of Villanova, Archbishop of Valencia, St. Ignatius, St. Francis Xavier, St. Francis Borgia, St. Teresa, and St. Philip Neri, as well as many other great men whom I do not mention, were greatly devoted to the Rosary. Follow their example. Your spiritual directors will be very pleased, and if they are aware of the benefits which you can derive from this devotion, they will be the first to urge you to adopt it. 27th Rose To encourage you still more in this devotion practiced by so many holy people, I should like to add that the rosary recited with the meditation of the mysteries brings about the following marvelous results. 1. It gradually brings us a perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ. 2. It purifies our souls from sin. 3. It gives us victory over all our enemies. 4. It makes the practice of virtue easy. 5. It sets us on fire with the love of our Lord. 6. It enriches us with graces and merits. 7. It supplies us with what is needed to pay all our debts to God and to our fellow men. And finally, it obtains all kinds of graces from God. The knowledge of Jesus Christ is the science of Christians and the science of salvation. It surpasses, says St. Paul, all human sciences in value and perfection. One, because of the dignity of its object, which is a God-man, compared to whom the whole universe is but a drop of dew or a grain of sand. Two, because of its utility to us. Human sciences only fill us with the wind and emptiness of pride. Three, because of its necessity. For no one can be saved without the knowledge of Jesus Christ, while a person who knows absolutely nothing of any other science will be saved as long as he is enlightened by the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the rosary which gives us this science and knowledge of our blessed Lord through our meditations of his life, death, passion, and glory. 
The Queen of Sheba, lost in admiration at Solomon's wisdom, cried out, "Blessed are your attendants and your servants, who are always in your presence and hear your wisdom." But happier still are the faithful who carefully meditate on the life, virtues, sufferings, and glory of our Savior, because by this means they can gain perfect knowledge of Him, in which eternal life consists. Our Lady revealed to Blessed Alan that no sooner had Saint Dominic begun preaching the Rosary than hardened sinners were touched and wept bitterly over their grievous sins. Young children performed unbelievable penances. And everywhere he preached the Rosary, such fervor was aroused that sinners changed their lives and edified everyone by their penances and the amendment of their lives. If by chance your conscience is burdened with sin, take your Rosary and say at least a part of it in honor of some of the mysteries of the life, passion, and glory of Jesus Christ, and you can be sure that while you are meditating on these mysteries and honoring them, He will show His sacred wounds to His Father in heaven. He will plead for you and obtain for you contrition and the forgiveness of your sins. One day, our Lord said to Blessed Alan, "If only these poor wretched sinners would say my Rosary often, they would share in the merits of my Passion, and I would be their advocate and would appease the justice of God." This life is a continual war and a series of temptations. We do not have to contend with enemies of flesh and blood, but with the very powers of hell. What better weapon could we possibly use to combat them than the prayer which our great leader has taught us, than the angelic salutation which has put the devils to flight, destroyed sin, and renewed the world? What better weapon could we use than meditation on the life and passion of Jesus Christ? For as Saint Peter tells us, it is with this thought that we must arm ourselves in order to defend ourselves against the very same enemies whom He has conquered and who molest us every day. Ever since the devil was crushed by the humility and the passion of Jesus Christ, says Cardinal Hughes, he has been practically unable to attack a soul that is armed with meditation on the mysteries of our Lord's life. And if he does trouble such a soul, he is sure to be shamefully defeated. Put on the armor of God so as to be able to resist the attacks of the devil. So arm yourself with the arms of God, with the Holy Rosary, and you will crush the devil's head and stand firm in the face of all his temptations. That is why even a pair of rosary beads is so terrible to the devil, and why the saints have used them to fetter him and drive him from the bodies of those who were possessed. Such happenings have been recorded more than once. Blessed Alan relates that a man he knew had tried desperately all kinds of devotions to rid himself of the evil spirit which possessed him, but without success. Finally, he thought of wearing his rosary round his neck, which eased him considerably. He discovered that whenever he took it off, the devil tormented him. Cr